We have Dr. Lauren DeGrieff. She was formerly a research chemist at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory's Chemistry Division, and she's currently Associate Professor at Florida International University's Global Forensic and Justice Center. Dr. Stephanie Vaughn, a NRC postdoctoral fellow at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory's Chemistry Division. Mr. Paul Bunker, the principal of Chiron Canine and a canine consultant and trainer. Dr. Ed Owens, a oil spill response consultant and president of Owens Coastal Consultants. And Dr. Stephen Tuttle, a research mechanical engineer in the chemistry division at the US Naval Research Laboratory. With that, I will turn it over to our first panelist. Hello, hi, I'm Dr. Lauren DeGrieff, as Michelle uh, mentioned. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so I just wanna give you a little bit of background about um, canine detection. So we're obviously discussing um, canines as detectors today. And I want you to think about them um, as being very similar or working in a very similar manner to um, electronic vapor detectors. So if you have some sort of vapor sensing device, you must first get the analytes of interest to the detector um, and we do this through sampling. So for the dog, that means that the analyte in the vapor form is coming in through the nose during the sniff. Then canines are also lucky enough to have a pre-concentration system um, in their mucus layer inside of their, inside of their muzzle and that acts um, to collect analytes and then send a bolus of it to the olfactory receptors. The olfactory system is where the detection and perception occurs um, the olfactory receptors interact with the analyte that's gone through the mucus layer, and it causes a cascade of events that leads towards odor perception and discrimination in the olfactory bulb. And also like mechanical um, instrumentation, fundamental research, standardization, and rigorous testing is necessary to um, understand how the detection is occurring and to make it better and improve proficiency, detection proficiency. And so this has been the overarching goal of our collaboration. Next slide, please. So why do we have oil detection canines? Well, part of the work that I've been involved in for many years during oil spills is conducting shoreline surveys or pipeline right of way surveys. And these are done physically by uh, experienced and trained surveyors who basically walk the shoreline or, or walk the, the, uh, the pipeline looking for oil uh, visually. And when we have any subsurface oil, the issue there is that we have to dig pits or trenches. And that is a very slow process. Um, a couple of pictures here on the right-hand side, the beaches of Alaska in particular, very coarse sediments. I and mean, it can take half an hour or sometimes even longer just to dig one pit down a few feet. Next slide, please. Um, and so we're relying on, oh, I, I guess we didn't pop up the text on the previous one. Uh, it was talking about uh, the text, yeah, it's all hidden. Um, the reason we use dogs is that because they are very accurate. They, in the field trials that we've conducted, uh, controlled field trials or during oil spill response operations, we've got a, a 98 plus percent verification of subsurface oil that they've been able to find. They, this enables us uh, to use them to clear areas of either small amounts of surface oil or any amount of subsurface oil very quickly and efficiently. We, um, the rate at which we dig pits, as I mentioned, is very slow. We can perhaps as a team in a low tide do uh, a dozen or two, whereas dogs can cover um, hundreds of yards, uh, miles of shoreline during that same time period. And with 100% coverage, whereas if we're digging pits or trenches, uh, we're only looking at a small sample of what might be in the subsurface. Next slide, please. And, and so the reason um, we use them is, is they're a game changer. We're taking science, uh, the science, canine science and applying it to survey techniques that we've been using for the past 20 years. They can speed up traditional surveys, but in particularly, they actually uh, free up the experienced surveyors to go and, and work in other areas where perhaps their skills are, are uh, more appropriate. 
a dog can do a reconnaissance survey. And we've got Paul Bunker on the left uh, working a, a river spill in Saskatchewan. And uh, the next picture from the left is Dale. He's actually sitting on the boat. And I don't know if you can see Patton. He's the little, um, there's a speck of uh, golden retriever there on the riverbank, which would not be an area that normally we would be able to survey easily or quickly. And so the canines can help us locate surface oil more quickly and, and find any subsurface oil without us having to dig. Do we, do we need them every time we go out on a survey? Well, no, not necessarily. But uh, in, SCAT, by the way, stands for Shoreline Cleanup Assessment Technique. And every, every time we conduct a shoreline cleanup assessment survey, we should consider whether or not a, a, a canine, an oil detection canine, is applicable for those situations. Next, please. You're on mute, Lauren. I am, thank you, Stephanie. All right, and thank you, Ed. Where was I? Okay, so um, NRL and now also FIU um, endeavor to better understand the odor and um, from the crude oil being detected by the canines and how variables like um, oil source and weathering affect odor. We know that those things are going to change odor. We know that different, or we don't know, but we'd like to know if different oil sources could potentially have different odor profiles or different, um, or could dogs experience those uh, differently. And then we do know that weathering is gonna affect odor, um, but we don't know how much um, and how. Um, and, and then we want to know how these variables will affect detectability. So in the lab, we use something called solid phase microextraction or SPEMI to, it traps odor molecules associated with the crude oil. Um, and these odor molecules are referred to as odorants going forward. Uh, and then we trap them on the SPEMI fiber, which is a sorbent polymer um, that goes in the headspace or the uh, vapor above the crude oil sample. Um, once we trap them on there, we can remove it and we bring that to our gas chromatography mass spectrometer for analysis. The fiber, when it's removed from the sample, it is placed in the gas chromatograph inlet where it is thermally desorbed. And then the GC um, separates the individual odorants within the complex mixture and identification occurs by the mass spec. And then on the right here, you see an example of crude oil odor, um, the chromatograph, where each peak is an individual compound in the headspace. And you can see that it's very complex. And this is from a fresh oil. So to uh, probe canine detection, we can actually remove the mass spec. Next slide, please. And next slide also, there we go. And um, so we remove the mass spec and then we put a sorbent material at the end of the GC instead. Um, and we can collect fractions or portions of the chromatogram um, as we wish onto that sorbent material. And that can then be used to test the dogs. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of where we took uh, three different portions of the chromatogram, the highly volatile that comes out first, followed by the volatile, followed by the semi-volatile, and we were able to send those to Paul and um, probe the canine detection response to those particular fractions of the oil. Next slide, please. Okay, and here we see an example of some of our instruments. Okay, here we see an example of our instrumental data. On the left, we are comparing the odors from two sources of crude oil. So we have Hoops, which is Hoover Offshore Oil Pipeline, and then we have the Alaskan North Slope. So we look at this in pie charts um, because they're just such complicated chromatograms. And what we're doing here is summarizing the different classes of compounds found in the headspace. And while there are many similarities between these two different crude oils, um, we can see some distinct differences as well, such as if you look at the ANS, it has the presence of polycyclic aromatics and branched alkenes, the red and the purple um, portions of the pie uh, that you don't see in the hoops. And in fact, if you um, statistically compare the similarities of the two using Spearman rank correlation, um, which you see in this table in the upper right, we can see that hoops and ANS can be statistically differentiated based on their odor. And it's this sort of information that we're interested in that can be used to help inform canine training protocols and will ultimately, we hope, result in highly effective canine detection. Next slide, please. And this is Paul's video.
Hey, so one of the major limitations in training a canine or actual uh, underwater oil detection is the fact that we can't put oil into a water source to allow us um, to train the dog so it can be rewarded and, under and understand that oil is a productive odor it needs to look for. So the team developed an underwater device which allows us to pump the headspace through bubbles under the uh, watercourse bed and then it emanates from the surface into a plume and I've trained my dog here, Poppy, to search off the front of a boat and look for that plume as if it's being carried in the air. And you can see Poppy bouncing left and right on front of the boat. Ahead of us is a patch of bubbles. We've left the device on so that you can visualize where this odor is coming out and actually the wind's coming into our face. So she's starting to smell oil um, coming from the surface and she's guiding me by moving left and right on the front of the boat to keep me in the plume. Once she's in the center of the plume, she stays on the front of the boat and you can see she's trying to get off the boat and actually go down to the source because she knows at some point when she gets to the source, there her reward's gonna arrive, which is a ball, and she gets to play a game. So the whole process is based on positive reinforcement, that is that the smell is associated with a game and a, a toy, but also we have to model the behaviors so the dog understands if I search from the front of this boat and then direct the boat to the source of that smell, which is following the plume carried on the air, then I'm gonna get my toy. Um, and as I said, the huge limitation was enabling us to train a dog to do that simply because we couldn't put actual oil into a source of water. So we developed this device which bubbles the smell of oil, but not oil itself. All right, thank you all so much for uh, listening to us today and we're happy to take any questions. Something Paul and I were talking about was how long does it take you to train an oil detection canine? Uh, the training process is approximately 45 days, but that's not eight hours a day. Um, that's generally one or two hours training a day. Um, obviously, there's a lot of welfare that goes into the dog, so uh, walking and feeding and cleaning, etc. But typically, we'll have a group of dogs and that group can be trained within 45 days or uh, 45 hours of training. And are the dogs currently being deployed? Yes, um, I have two operational oil detection dogs um, and there are others around the country. So um, we are using research such as this with NRL, um, but also I am on standby for any oil spill responses. And as uh, Dr. Owens pointed out, there was a photograph of me up in Canada with one of my dogs doing a shoreline survey uh, we've been to Alaska, again, as Dr. Owen said, uh, Wyoming, Florida, California, you know, all over to incidents, both oil spill response and pipelines. Looks like we have a question in the chat. Uh, Freda is asking, how long have dogs been used to detect oil? And I, yeah, so uh, for our phase, um, and I think Dr. Owens will actually give a little bit of the history because he came up with a concept within the United States, but our phase, 2015, we started our first trial, which was a, a concept to just prove that dogs could find subsurface oil. And then from there, we actually deployed up to Nova Scotia. And uh, really from that point, we've been using oil detection dogs in various scenarios and research. Um, but as I said, it, it's a bit older than that. And Dr. Owens knows a bit more of the background. Yeah, there's, um, it's going back probably about um, just over 12 years now, there was a joint industry project in Northern Norway 
I, I had, uh, I work a lot on oil shorelines and I had a shoreline experiment there in uh, 1998 and we had spilled oil on the shoreline. We cleaned it up, and, but we left some control plots. And um, subsequently, uh, a chemist, a research chemist who was working in the area with his dog, he had trained his dog um, on various different targets and decided to uh, to train his, his pet dog on oil. And he went to the beach that we had worked that many, a decade or more earlier. And his the first oil detection canine, his pet dog found that oil that we had left behind, buried down about two feet. And um, at that point we got, he said, wow, this is uh, interesting. He wrote it all up and he's, I've known this, a gentleman, he works at Sintef in, uh, in Norway, known him for many years. And I, I was visiting him one day and he showed me what his dog could do. And then I came back and as Paul said, uh, well, we, we met up at an oil spill conference, Paul and I, and started talking about things. And we ended up getting the research projects with were initially funded by American Petroleum Institute. And that's what started the ball rolling basically. As Liza said, if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself and ask it as well. You don't have to type it into the chat, especially for long questions that can be. And if you deploy with one of the canines, where do they live while you're deployed? in the hotel room with us or Airbnb or whatever the accommodation is, you know, that um, they stay with us, they transport on the boats or the vehicles or whatever with us. So, I mean, they're with us 24 seven whenever we deploy. And have you found that there are specific breeds that work well for this type of task? Yeah, you know, generally we go for the uh, hunter, type breed, so Labrador, I've got a Springer Spaniel, as you saw on the video, um, for a number of reasons. One, innately, they're used to hunt and uh, give a response to a target. In this case, obviously, we've taken their natural ability to find game, birds or whatever, and paired it with an odor um, and made it rewardable experience. But also, they're compact and mobile. So imagine, oh, you saw a picture of Dale on the front, sat on the front of a boat. You know, they're quite tight spaces because there'll be four people on that boat with the scat team, the dog and the handler um, and flying even. You know, you want a smaller dog for flying. So part of it is because of size, both the transportation and actual usage on the ground. And then part of it is those capabilities with the dogs. That's not to say that any dog can do this job that has a capability. So, you know, a stray could do this or a mixed breed could do this if it holds the natural traits and capability. It's just that we prefer those dogs that have the innate abilities already in them before we start training. The other advantage with things like Labradors and the, some of the Spaniels is they like treats. So although typically I'll use a ball or a Kong toy or something, if we're out on a long search, we can, oh, I've had 183 confirmed finds in one day. If you can imagine a ball, try, uh, a dog trying to, play with its tennis ball 183 fines, uh, times a day, plus it's already covered 10 to 15 miles of survey. You know, they get pretty fed up and tired, but if you're giving them a piece of cheese or hot dog, they'll keep going all day, chomp it down and off they go again. So, you know, again, those breeds very much enjoy snacks as well as playing games. Add on a little bit. The big limitation on dogs is not the dogs, it's the people trying to keep up with them and having the energy to follow them through all this terrain. I have a question. Do you ever have a problem with the dogs leaving out of the boat into the sturdy water and just getting really gross <laughs> when you're trying to do the work? Uh, kind of. So, you know, generally, as you saw, you know, I have the dog on under control and they have a life vest on. Um, but 
Um, you saw the picture of Dale sat on the front of the boat and a large road in bank side with the dog on. I mean, initially for the first three days of that deployment and in total, we were there six months over the course of four years. You know, so that was a lot of time we was up there. I think, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Owens, we covered something like 600 kilometers of ground, but a lot of that was mud, deep, um, fire, deep water with deep mud. And of course, the dogs are in that. And as well as some of the islands, um, they were just mud, mud banks. And the dogs were in, in that mud banks running around. So as part of the work, yeah, you know, and of course, Labradors, we had all Labradors. They just love to dive in the water and roll in mud and everything as part of their uh, in off time, you know, while they're enjoying their downtime. So, yeah, I mean, they did get covered. We were fortunate in that case that literally a, a block from the hotel was a dog wash. And every day we would take the dogs around there and just put them through the dog wash before we took them back to the hotel room. We have another question from Jennifer. She said that her internet cut out earlier. Could someone speak to the challenges of the current technique for finding oil? Yes, um, I, I can do that. We, after Deepwater Horizon, uh, American Petroleum Institute funded uh, a variety of different projects to look at the state of the art. And one of these was to look at um, the, the current technology at the time in 2013, 2014 for a number of things, including looking for subsurface oil, because that was a big problem in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, oil came ashore from the Deepwater Horizon uh, spill, and a lot of it uh, was buried on the beaches, and we had trouble finding it, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we're just pedestrians walking along and digging a, a pit or a trench every now and again. And so the, our challenge was, um, you know, just the time and effort to find subsurface oil. Surface oil is, is fairly straightforward, um, you know, visually or well, basically visually, even sitting on an ATV, but it's the subsurface oil that is uh, the big challenge. And there really isn't anything uh, out there that uh, is anywhere near as efficient as a dog. On some of the trials, we use a, a machine called a, a PID, a photo ionization detection tool which is accurate down to a couple of parts uh, per million. But in the controlled field trials that we've had, where we've had placed targets 15 feet below the surface, the uh, Paul's dogs have run over and go straight to the source of that odor. Whereas a person walking along with a, a PID uh, had to hold, had to stand still and hold that PID over the tube uh, above the target before any detection was indicated on the instrument. And, and so, I mean, a dog can run and find something that a sophisticated piece of machinery doesn't find very easily and only when the portal or the sampling port is held very, very close to the ground. Um, so, you know, we don't have a lot of good tools in the toolbox, basically. And, for example, pipeline leaks where there's, um, you know, a buried pipeline maybe down six, ten feet. Um, we got called out Thanksgiving last year for a, a pipeline leak, uh, and they had not been able to find it after about five or six days. Um, the dog was able to find it, uh, you know, within a couple of hours. So um, we just don't have good tools in the toolbox, and so dogs have, I say, they're a, a science game changer as. as uh, Dr. DeGreef pointed out, I mean, you've got a laboratory right there on four legs um, that can run uh, at good speed. And that's, you know, I mean, it's pretty amazing. It, you have to see one of these dogs at work. They're just so quick. You have to ask them to do it twice uh, because it's all over and done with very quickly. Another question that we had talked about is how does the science behind this differ um, with research into drug or explosive detection for canines? That's a great question. Um, it's actually very similar. 
um, in in the analytical instrumentation that we use um, from, so I do a lot of work to support canine detection. And what I do is I characterize odors and that odor may be from narcotics and it might be from explosives, it might be from oil. Um, the methods I use are very similar. Um, where the huge, the really big difference is, is that there's not at very many um, canine targets that have such complex odor signatures as oils, um, with the exception of maybe human remains. But uh, if you look at an explosive, um, when I look at it on my instrument, I may see one to maybe four compounds coming from that explosive. So if you think about the chromatogram that I showed, just a few peaks will be coming off of it. And so it's pretty easy for me to identify. And then if I wanna say which one of those peaks does the dog need for detection, I can simply make, um, make training aids from those four different odors and present them to the dog and I can make combinations and we can get an idea of maybe what, um, what the odors that are that are important for the dog detection. But when you talk about crude oils and you have just a hundreds, hundreds of peaks, it's much, much more complicated to figure out what it is that the dog needs for detection. And the reason why that's important is because um, you want the dog, you want to take a dog, a, a new dog, and you want to be able to, the dog to be able to find any type of crude oil. So um, for example, in my slide, I showed that there's different types of crude oils and there are, there are statistical differences in the odor. And so we wanna encourage the dog to generalize and be able to detect lots of different sources of crude oil. Um, alternatively, there may be an occasion where we are interested in finding a specific type of crude oil. Maybe there's been a spill and we only want the dog to find fresh. And this is maybe in the Gulf where there are old tar balls, old, very, very weathered oil, and we want the dog to ignore that. So differences in those um, chromatograms in that odor that I look at on the instrument is very important. Um, and and, and the, all those nuances that are, the narcotics and explosives tend to not be that complicated. So it's, it's a really interesting um, field that I've just recently started studying and we've been enjoying it. Looks like we have another question. I'm hoping you can tell us more about how widely dogs are being used to detect oil. Also, what happens after a dog spots a spill? Um, not as widely as we'd like, I think is the honest answer to that. Uh, as, as Paul said, we started investigating the potential um, with controlled experiments in 2015. So um, on, on spills in which I get involved, I would always consider right off the bat taking a dog, but it, it's because I'm used to using them. I know where they uh, work well, and I know where there's occasions where they don't work so well, like the current spill down in Southern California from the pipeline break there. Um, there's so much uh, oil there that you really don't need a dog to find it. And, and, and so the, there's not as much use as I would like. I think the greater potential um, that really needs to be exploited is for pipeline leak detection or just even for clearance of, of, uh, of, of pipeline rights of way. As, as part of normal operations, rights of way are, are routinely inspected, uh, but often it's somebody walking along. And um, if you have a sort of a very light oil, or a, a light product such as a gasoline, um, you, you, it may not even come to the surface in, in quantities that are uh, detectable by our noses because we're only two or three orders of magnitude as good as a dog. Um, uh, you know, a dog can get down to parts per billion. Uh, and recent studies that Paul and I did with uh, Dr. Hall at Texas Tech, they stopped measuring detection at, uh, what was it, six or seven parts um, per billion because there's no instrument that could verify those very small amounts of oil. Um, so they're not being used as widely as they could. Um, when a dog spots oil or indicates it, uh, then we, if, if we start digging, I mean, we go back to the thing that we really don't want to do uh, as much because it takes time and effort. So if a dog spots the oil, then the shoreline surveyor, the member of the shoreline cleanup assessment team will then start to verify uh, that there is subsurface oil. It, it's um, if you've got shorelines or rivers with lots of logs, um, 
that can be tricky. Sometimes we don't we don't always find the oil that the dog has indicated is present because say big log piles are not very safe to go into. So sometimes um, you know we don't we don't actually take the oil out. It just depends on the given circumstances. Paul, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, so actually one of the big advantages of the oil detection canine team is not finding oil. And what I mean by that is they can cover very large areas very quickly and tell you there is no oil present. So rather than a limited resource of the SCAT team um, having to dig all these pits and investigate areas, they can actually be prioritized and sent to areas where oil is known to be while the canine team and maybe with a, an assistant can cover large areas saying there is no oil here. And then when they come across some oil, the dog gives a response and the response is typically a sit, but basically the dog communicates to the handler, hey, there's a smell here that I know uh, is associated with a reward. So you need to give me my treat now. The handler actually marks the area and that can then be investigated later. So one of the huge advantages is the time, effort, and resources that the dog team saves in actually prioritizing areas that need investigated by the specialists, if you like. On Deepwater Horizon and Exxon Valdez, both of those, something like 60 to 70 percent of the shorelines that were surveyed had no of the oil and that really you know exactly what paul's saying we can we need to go to make sure that we haven't missed something because the last thing in the world we want after a survey is someone to turn around and say you missed a bit because then the confidence in in, in the still response is, is reduced and if you miss a bit twice well that's that's even worse so the dogs can truly help us cover these large areas which we survey not expecting to find oil but which we can tell the spill management team and the general public, yeah, we've been there, we've looked for it, and there isn't anything there. We have another question. They said they joined the session late, but is there a way to teach the canine team to detect specific concentration thresholds? Yeah, so as I said, we were deployed up to Canada for in total around six months over the course of four years. Um, and in that time, we had something like 10,000 alerts. Now, some of those alerts were huge mats of oil subsurface under um, banks of mud and all the way down to pieces of stain on reeds. The dogs were so good, they were just finding all the oil that was present in the environment as a result of the pipeline leak. But as uh, Doc Rowan's just said, you don't necessarily need to clean up all oil because biodegradation and the act of um, natural weathering will actually destroy that oil or, or um, not make it any concern on the environment and we don't have to find it. So one of the questions asked was, can you exactly this, can you train a dog to a specific threshold so that we can um, identify oil that needs cleaned up and then generally ignore oil which doesn't need cleaned up? Um, that actual question was researched last year through an API uh, study and uh, Texas Tech University conducted the research and it was found yes you can one a dog will naturally have an ability if you train it on a specific amount of target it will have a natural ability to uh, distinguish lower and higher thresholds to uh, a factor of 10 but you can then reinforce that and actually teach the dogs, ignore this amount of a target and respond to this amount of the same target. That was a, an initial pilot study that's been released because um, it was like four dogs. But it certainly gives you an indication that the concept exists. And the whole idea of that came from my experience with explosive detection, where I'd seen this is a limitation where we train the dogs on a certain amount of explosives and they ignore smaller amounts or really struggle in larger amounts. And we had to train the dogs to small and large amounts. And I realized that there was something going on there in the dog's capability to understand the difference. And the research actually reinforced that. So yes, 
the concept exists that we could calibrate dogs to specific amounts. And another question we had is, when you're working with the dogs, how easily can they be distracted by, um, by just things in the environment, like the other people or birds? Uh, well, they're dogs, you know, and at the end of the day, they're not machines, so they have their own minds. Um, we carefully select the dogs and we do a lot of training to try and prevent any of this happening. Now, I will tell you that in Canada um, and when I've worked in Wyoming and other areas, and in fact, Alaska, you know, we encountered moose, deer. Literally, my dog one day um, was nudged something and then carried on walking. And I just thought she'd been nudging a log or something. And as I walked by, it was a baby fawn curled up and she just nudged it and then ignored it and kept walking. Um, we had bear beaver actually a beaver jumped out of his hole and attacked me not attacked me but hit me in the legs i tell people it was an attack but it actually hit me in the legs and my dog just looked and carried on walking you know so as much as possible we want to get the dogs to uh, not be distracted by wildlife or conditions certainly we expose them as you can see to the boat we expose them to people walking around them um, in the training lab, which I'm in now during training, I have a speaker system and I'll have jungle sounds and trains and construction noise going on all the time just to get them used to these sort of things. As I said, ultimately, you know, they're dogs. And that's part of that association between or that bond between the handler and the dog, because I should be able to read my dog and see, you know, this dog's getting a little distracted by something. I'm going to intercept here and actually tell my dog to do something else and prevent that behavior or I spot a bear ahead I'm going to call my dog back to me um so part of it you know is the training but part of it as well is the communication between me and the dog and fortunately despite all those encounters we have had with our dogs um nothing untoward has happened um but as I said you know they are dogs at the end of the day let me give you a, a little personal side to that um a, a pipeline spill in Walnut Creek, California, in, um, along with something called the Iron Horse Trail. And this very popular place with everybody taking their dogs for a walk and uh, had um, a dog that Paul had trained and a handler who uh, also Paul had trained, a good friend of ours. And um, so we walked, we walked the trail and there, every minute a, a dog went by. On, on leash and every single dog wanted to come over and play with the detection dog and just ignored them. Uh, just get on with getting on with the job and focused, not distracted. And uh, that was really a testament to, you know, the, the training side of this. It is really important. A dog wants to do things naturally, but, uh, you know, and, and this is where, you know, Paul comes in as, as training, not only the dogs, but training the trainers sorry, tr uh, training the handlers um, so that we have teams out there. And uh, we had uh, four teams running concurrently up in Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan River spills. So, uh, but yeah, it's, they're, they're very much themselves, their own personalities. Now, I'm curious from um, the participants from the Naval Research Laboratory, how did the Naval Research Laboratory get involved in, uh, in this research? Steve, why don't you take that one? So I saw uh, Paul Bunker present this work at uh, an Arctic Marine Oil Pollution um, Technical Seminar up in Canada. And I was really intrigued and I knew Lauren was doing research uh, in this area well, not not with not with oil detection, but with explosives and blood, and, uh, and drugs. She had a really strong background with that. So um, I don't remember if I talked with with Paul or not, but I, one of the questions I asked was what, what chemicals were were being detected, and, and nobody really knew for sure what it was. So I thought so. I went back to Lauren, and we um, took some time. It took some, a while to 
contacts and people at uh, BSEE, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, until they, they give us some money to, to start to play with this, this idea. And it's been very productive. Yeah, I, um, I cold emailed Ed and uh, <laughs> was shocked when I think he called me back on the phone in like 30 minutes. I was shocked, but um, it's been a really fruitful uh, collaboration that we hope to continue. I called you back quickly because I don't usually get inquiries about dogs from uh, a US Naval Research Laboratory. <laughs> I was just as intrigued, but uh, that's how, I mean, Paul and I met uh, coincidentally, accidentally, Stephen Paul, uh, likewise, and and this is how things, this is how science grows. I mean, by people from different disciplines, uh, you know, uh, you know, cross communicating. Uh, I'm not a chemist by any stretch, and uh, I'm not a dog trainer by any stretch. I mean, I'm just a beach guy, you know. But when we can get people together with the different skill sets that, that combine, you know, two and two make five very quickly. Looks like we have a, a qu another question. Um, odor related complaints are some of the largest feedbacks local air quality agencies receive, especially in the US and Canada. Is there a potential for canine detection to alleviate such complaints? What are the rough cost comparisons of dynamic olfactory, uh, olfactory meter versus concentration based approximations versus canine detection? So a few different parts to that question. Paul, do you want to take part of that? Hmm. Uh, I mean, there's obviously a lot of science to that question and, and more, more than um, I'd be comfortable answering. But what I can say is potentially, you know, the dogs can detect any substances as long as it's not toxic um, or hazardous for them to smell. Um, so you can actually imprint a dog to find anything because all we're doing is we're associating or pairing a smell with a reward and they want to get a reward, whether that's play with a toy or get a piece of cheese, whatever it is. And they're going to tell you, I can smell that thing you've told me to smell. Um, therefore, I want my reward. It's perfectly feasible because you can collect samples remotely onto filters or some sort of medium and present them to the dogs. I mean, the dog doesn't have to be even present in a location to be able to tell you the odors there. All it needs is presented with air samples, um, again, potentially collected onto some sort of medium and then presented to a dog in a lab. Um, and the dog will actually tell you, yes, that smell exists on this medium or no, it doesn't. And that's very similar to what the team did at NRL by sending me samples uh, mm -hmm. through the mail on a medium. I presented it to the dog and the dog said, yes, I can smell that fraction of oil or no, I can't. Um, so conceptually, yes, a dog could do this, but I think there's a lot of science in the background there that obviously need answered about um, collecting those odors on some sort of medium. And then is it toxic? toxic for the dog to smell um, once it's been presented to him. Um, and I, I'll, I'll do my best to comment on the, the bottom portion of this. Um, I'm not entirely sure what dynamic olfactometry is. I know what olfactometry is. I'm not sure entirely what the dynamic portion of that means or concentration-based approximations. Um, so I apologize, but I will uh, attempt to compare the dog to the to like an e-nose, which is what is frequently used for um, air pollution sort of situations, um, an e-nose or electronic nose. They they do tend to be pretty or somewhat inexpensive relative for um, laboratory equipment and will be less expensive than a dog. Um, they, however, the, the, the ways that the dog tend to um, outdo pretty much any field detector that exists is they they are more sensitive. They even with um, some of the most high tech technologies out there, the dogs tend to have better sensitivity than most instruments. But that aside, 
Um, that's the main thing that people focus on. But that aside, the dogs have better selectivity. So what that means is the dogs are better at ignoring um, background odors and um, get less false alerts if they're trained properly, of course. If they're trained poorly, like anything else, they're, they're going to have false alerts. Um, instruments tend to have a lot of false alerts because um, if you look at a situation where the target, what you want the dog to detect, if there's a very low amount of vapor, let's say in this case, the oil is buried deep. So there's only a small amount of odor at the surface but that surface has um, like the beach, the beach has a lot of odor, right? Um, let's say that there's some dead fish in the area. That's a lot of odor and things like that, or it can be very difficult for E noses um, to work through all those additional volatiles when the thing that you're trying to detect is very low. Um, of course, we've talked a lot about the mobility of dogs. Um, there is no instrumental detector that will find the source the way a dog can. And then um, another big, uh, way that the dogs work better is trainability. If for some reason your target changes, you wanna add a target, um, there's some kind of difference. It's much easier to adjust a dog's training than it is to adjust your enos. I think there's a second half if you wanna read it, Michelle. Yeah, he just provided some background. A uh, dynamic olfactory meter depends on trained human noses, like in perfumery, concentration-based approximations depend on chemicals, calibrate odor to chemicals, like odor units. So yeah, the human nose is um, many orders of magnitude um, less efficient than a dog's. Uh, we the dogs are much more sensitive than a human nose. So it would be less about the cost and more about the capability. If you are in a situation like um, uh, the cosmetics industry, for instance, and you're dealing with a high amount of odor, humans would be very good because we can speak. We can explain what we're smelling. Um, that is, you know, a downside to the dog is that they can't tell us what they're detecting. Um, but if you're talking about things that are at a low level, the dogs are just much better than the humans. Um, their olfactory systems are set up in a much more efficient way. They can more efficiently move odor from in front of them to their nose, and then they move the air within their space within their nose much more efficiently than humans. Um, there's other animals like rats and mice that are also built, their olfactory system are built more like canines and um, are very good detectors. They're just not as easily trained, I suppose rats are. Um, and then um, concentration based on calibrate odor to chemical. Stephanie, can you help me? Thoughts on the second half? Because I'm still a bit confused. I am too. I, uh... I apologize. I'm not sure what we mean by calibrate odor to chemicals exactly or, or odor units. So um, yeah, I can, I, can, I can just speak to that. So basically Thanks. I think uh, what, I mean, from an air quality perspective, it's so hard to monitor odors uh, that the way I guess we work around that issue uh, to incorporate dispersion modeling uh, which basically means that we kind of take uh, feedback from citizens that, oh, they detected odor at a certain location. We take our instruments there, we detect specific chemicals, and then we, when, and then we trace them back using thin trajectories. So the only way to go from chemical concentration to the odor itself is through this metric of odor units, which is, I mean, you know, there's no, like, I wouldn't say there's a basis to it. It's like an approximate way of, um, uh, creating a level of different orders by diluting the concentration. Yeah, so, I understand what you're saying, okay. Okay, I great. think. Yeah, so basically you're saying that the methods are semi-quantitative, semi that you can get yeah. relative comparisons, but not absolute amounts. Exactly, yeah. Right, um, and the dog is obviously not going to give us, again, without the speaking, not going to give us any information um, unless Paul has trained them to ignore certain mm -hmm. high or low levels um, but we have, we run into the same issue in our instrument, in our laboratory. It is very, very hard to get quantitative measurements of vapor. Vapor is hard to um, trap. In, well, it's not hard to trap, but it's hard to get instantaneous measurements of, um, of vapor concentration. So we also frequently deal with semi-quantitative work unless somebody wants to spend, uh, throw a lot of research dollars at us, and then we can do the quantitative work. But um, generally we stay in the semi-quantitative as well. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course.
Yeah, yeah. Another question, um, just as you guys are, are moving forward is, where do you see this research going in the future? Um, I know that we are interested in doing more underwater work. Uh, Paul had mentioned his underwater device when we did the slides um, and, and, that, and just to go back a little bit, and Paul, I apologize if I um, don't explain this as well as you would, but basically um, in order to train the dogs to detect um, obscured water that's or obscured, obscured oil that is under the water that you wouldn't uh, be able to see that there maybe aren't very good techniques for detecting. Um, Paul has trained the dogs using his underwater device, which he's just very recently um, developed and has just been doing initial testing. And so what we would like to do is do some further research um, on our side and look at how the odor changes as it moves through the water. So that's one of our things of interest. Um, also interested in um, how odor moves as it goes through soil. And I am, um, Ed or Paul, could you jump in? Cause my mind is going blank on a couple of our other good ideas. Yeah, I'll quickly go first on the, uh, particularly on the uh, device. So the device actually allows me to model the behaviors for the dog of how to detect a plume being carried across a water source and then to guide the boat, as you saw, to the source and then tell me, here is the oil below us. But the problem at the moment is, is purely for training. And while it's been totally successful in the training phase, what we have to do is prove that actually that same dog can transfer that behavior into real life because, you know, at this point, all I've done is train a dog to find the headspace being bubbled through the water course um, and the plume being developed from that. But the application ultimately would be having the dog on the front of a boat at a real spill or a real incident or a real pipeline leak that's underwater. So for me, you know, the next phase is to prove the, the technique can be applied. And then, you know, this can become actually a training technique as one of the steps in training. But we know that there is some sort of applied application that it would transfer to. And, um, to add on a bit, there's, there's an, another really useful um, application. That is where you have... Uh, mentioned earlier, we get seeps all in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Santa Barbara Channel, California, many places in the world. And if you have an oil spill and we have then a mixed uh, population of oils. And uh, the, the, I remember a case up in uh, Oregon uh, about 10 years ago where there were 13 different oils on the uh, vessel. And we could tell how far up the coast the oil from the vessel had gone before we were getting no more hits related to the vessel and just going into background. And so if a dog can be trained on a specific oil and to ignore the other background oils, then we can in fact identify the footprint, if you like, of that oil spill. How far has it extended in one direction? And at, at what point uh, is it no longer the responsibility of the uh, of the polluter, the, the the responsible party as we call them, uh, and just becomes a background level. Other, otherwise, they could be forced to continue cleaning up uh, oil, which is not their responsibility. They were not responsible for the background level. So, if we can get, a, um, you know, uh, Dr. Degree, if you use the word generalization, if we can get this discrimination to use uh, a canine on one particular oil. That's going to help us in the field in a very practical way. Yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Thank you, Ed. Um, because we, so I'm now at Florida International University with the, with the Global Forensics and Justice Center, which so we have forensic applications. And um, since we saw a little bit of this ability to discriminate between two different sources of oil, we're also interested in the forensic application. Um, would Could we use the Headspace profile to identify um, one type of comp, one type of oil over the other. Um, and then if we could team with Ed and Paul and bring the dogs in and do the same thing and all work together, that could be a very effective way of, um, as, as Ed said, fingerprinting the, the path of an oil spill. 
And then one other thing that I think we mentioned, we didn't mention yet is um, interest in how weathering affects oil. Weathering has a dramatic effect on the um, odor that it produces, the lights tend to go away and bigger compounds break down and produce new light, new light compounds. Um, and that potentially affects uh, how the canine detects oil. And we can use that to our advantage. As I mentioned, we might want the dog to generalize and be able to find um, all different crude oils of, at different stages of weathering, or we might want to have the dog only find the fresh oil. And so we can explore that more analytically in the lab and then bring that to Paula and ask questions and probe that more as well. Stephanie, did I miss anything? No, you did not. You were going to miss the weathering, but you added it in. It looks like we just have a few minutes left. Does anyone have any last questions that they want to ask? Right. Well, I'd like to say a big thanks to all of our panelists, to the organizers, the great moderation, and to our reporters for dropping in and listen and ask questions. Um, if you have more questions for our panelists, we'll have contact information for you available on the website, as well as the slides that you saw and a recording of this session. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.